Back in June, I wrote a feature about the CMHC saga in 2020, starting with their forecast for house prices, moving into the real estate industry's reaction to these house price decline forecasts, and also fitting in a few snappy one-liners from CEO Evan Sedal, and culminating with their underwriting changes and essentially what this means for the market. Little did I know that it wouldn't even cover half of what happened with the CMHC this year. This is the year the CMHC riled up Canadian real estate. First, some housekeeping. I've been meaning to do a video on the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation since I covered it back in June with this feature called Evans et al. vs. the World. Now the article will end on less of a cliffhanger and will be completely wrapped up in this video. Hopefully. You can give the article a read, I put it in the description below, but I will be going over the major talking points of the article, kind of summarizing the details. If you've already read the article and you just want to find out what happens next, then just skip to this part of the video. The reason why making this video is such a challenge is because it has been tremendously difficult to keep up with the rapid fire rate of developments, whether it's from a CMHC announcement or a tweet from Evans et al. or a news story that just prompts this renewed conversation. So naturally, the financial headlines have been a gadling gun of CMHC mentions this year. For five minutes, could you not make the news? For five minutes! I wanted to do this video explainer on CMHC in 2020, but I also wanted to do something that looks at Evan Sedol's tenure at the CMHC. It, it's a bit much to cover both those things in one video, so I'm starting with the CMHC in 2020 and then I'll look at an analysis in a few months from now. Obviously, with the Evan Sedol tenure piece, it would have to come out in December, and I just can't wait that long to talk about CMHC. I usually fit my own opinion into these videos, and I usually dedicate an entire section to kind of share my own thoughts on a certain topic, but I'm gonna keep my thoughts to myself in this video because these events are still unfolding and I'm still actively covering them, so it's really important to remain as objective as possible. Down the line, I'll probably be more open to sharing my opinion, but for now, I'm just leaving myself out of it. I'll try to capture everything that's happening here. There may be new developments as I'm working through what I expect to be a very extensive editing process with this video. If that's the case, I'll find a way to shoehorn it later on in the development process. But anyway, let's jump right in. Before this pandemic kicked off, we were seeing real estate prices hitting their 2017 highs. A few real estate analysts I've been speaking to are saying that this, isn't a, this wasn't a speculative bubble so much as people were actually buying a home to live in. I made a video about these trends, it was actually the first video I've made, you can check it out in the description. As these prices were soaring, the COVID-19 pandemic struck hard in March and April, leading to 5.5 million Canadians who were either out of work or were working such significantly reduced hours that they were falling behind on their bill payments and really just needed some sort of government support. And this happened because of the nat nationwide lockdown that we saw in response to the pandemic. To put this into a kind of perspective, the sheer size of the job loss from this pandemic utterly dwarfed the 2008-2009 recession. So naturally, real estate analysts and hobbyist market watchers alike were wondering, what does this mean for Canadian housing? For the real estate bears, this was practically the black swan event they were waiting for, arguing that the surge in unemployment and pause in immigration would finally calm the record high house prices Canada has been seeing in its major cities. The bulls, on the other hand, argue that with these immensely low interest rates and the fact that these job losses disproportionately impacted renters meant that once the lockdown lifted, these prospective home buyers would be immediately flocking to the market. Most banks and real estate companies were pretty optimistic about the situation. At the time, most were either saying it, the impact would be minimal, like no price decline at all, or we're kind of looking at a single-digit decline at worst. 
Granted, this came at a time when the virus was relatively new. There were a lot of unknowns about the trajectory of the virus, how long the most intense part of the lockdown would last, and what the consumer psychology would actually look like on the other side of uh, this, this lockdown. And once the provinces reopened, what would people actually end up doing? Amidst the optimism, the CMHC had its own report. And boy, it didn't hold back. Evans et al. has never been one to shy away from speaking his mind. He's been very vocal about Canadian household debt and the first-time homebuyer incentive. He tends to have a very contrarian tone to real estate professionals, but this tone hit its apex in 2020. In a Zoom meeting with the Parliamentary Committee of Finance, Sedol presented the most bleak outlook any market watcher had heard at the time, saying that house prices could drop between 9 and 18% over the next 12 months. Moreover, CMHC is now forecasting a decline in average house prices in Canada of 9 to 18 percent in the coming 12 months. The resulting combination of higher mortgage debt, declining house prices and increased unemployment is cause for concern for Canada's longer term financial stability. Another slide I gave you quotes Hyman Minsky, who said debt causes fragility. He also added that the organization estimated that 12% of mortgage holders would elect to defer their mortgage, and by September this number could actually reach 20%. Remax was the first out of the gate, calling the report panic-inducing and irresponsible. They themselves had been looking at a 3.8% increase in house prices right at the beginning of the year before the pandemic happened. Since COVID's impact, they started calling for a single-digit correction at worst. More recently, I spoke with Remax Executive Vice President Christopher Alexander, who explained that they're expecting stable prices in the fall, but then by 2021, this is when they expect to see the economic impacts of COVID-19 start to bear down on house prices. That last tidbit wasn't included in the article, but I thought it was worth mentioning now. The Canadian Real Estate Association told market watchers to just ignore the gloomy forecast. This was followed by a lot of real estate professionals being quoted in the media saying that they just didn't agree with the CMHC's forecast. When facing this kind of smearing in the press, most CEOs would back off, kind of stay quiet, wait for the whole thing to blow over. Sadal isn't most CEOs. Sadal snapped back in late May, revealing more details of the housing outlook, throwing the panic-inducing and irresponsible label right back in the industry's face. They're whistling past the graveyard and offering no analysis. Here's ours. You decide. I still can't believe Twitter is free. There's more, by the way. Please question the motivation of anyone who wants you to believe that prices will go up. Yes, up. With our economy in slow motion, oil being given away, millions of Canadians on income support, and a greater percentage of mortgages not being paid than we've seen since the Great Depression. When I wrote the story for Yahoo Finance Canada, I got the reaction from real estate wizard Ron Butler, a mortgage broker with his own firm. Ron explained that calling for a growth in house prices right now was literally irrational. He also commended Sadal on his never back down attitude. I should also mention that Ron and Evan are sort of Twitter bros, so it goes to show that Sadal isn't gratuitously lambasting real estate professionals for its own sake. He actually gets along with quite a few of them. A lot of real estate professionals were left scratching their heads and saying, just what is the CMHC seeing that we don't? The CMHC once again had the real estate industry reeling when they announced new lending measures that would put further limits on Canadians who were trying to get into the housing market, particularly first-time home buyers. Here are the new rules. One applicant's credit score must be a minimum of 680, up from 600. Total debt service ratios will now be 42% down from 44%, and gross debt service ratios must now be 35%, which was previously 39%. These measures went into effect July 1st, but leading up to that date, there was a range of opinions from real estate professionals. 
I spoke with one agent whose clients were ready to make that purchase until the new lending measures were put in place and now had to qualify for about 12% less. It could have even cut some of the fringe buyers out of the market altogether, which is understandably crushing for somebody who felt that they were ready to make that decision. People wondered if this underwriting rule change was actually factored into the negative price outlook. Um, I wrote myself, after all, it's probably easier to make an 18% price drop bet when you're holding the aces. Sadal responded to that part of my article saying, our underwriting changes were not a factor in our price outlook. In any event, our estimate is that they will have an effect of less than 0.5% in average house prices in Canada. Cool. Real estate agents also grumbled about the CMHC intervening on a free market. Ben Rabidou, a macroeconomic analyst and president of North Cove Advisors, was having none of that. The entire mortgage lobby has a direct federal guarantee and multiple layers of direct federal guarantees that subsidize them, so cry me a friggin' river. The government from time to time has the right and should be reevaluating their position given the changing risk landscape. That's how it's supposed to work, it's not a free market. Ben's a riot, and he makes sense. The CMHC at the end of the day is a business and it will do what it can to reduce the risk to said business. Once the CMHC set this standard, the private lenders like Genworth Canada and Canada Guarantee didn't actually follow the mandate, they kept their underwriting rules the same. This is important, remember this later. I ended the article saying that uh, house prices were breaking new records that month and it's a trend that continued even now as I'm recording this in early September. And a lot of analysts I've spoken to attribute this trend to pent up demand after the lockdown, something that Bulls kind of alluded to. Evan Sadal responded to this article in a Twitter thread, doubling down on his house price forecasts and upholding the reasons why he needs to speak out. To those who say I should stay quiet, I say that I have a duty to be open and transparent. We are accountable to Canadians. Many agents and brokers work hard to help our housing markets function. I am compelled to single out those who I think are offering self-serving, irresponsible opinions as a part of my accountability to Canadians to offer evidence-based opinions and advice. Sadal was going all out. People loved it. It was at this point I thought everything was wrapped up and I was done writing about the CMHC. In mid-July, an Ottawa-based online news source, Blacklocks Reporter, released a report saying that the feds and the CMHC were funding a $250,000 study on home equity tax. It blew up on real estate Twitter, and so of course I had to write about what the CMHC had planned with this home equity tax research and what the implications were and just kind of do a deep dive on this controversial topic. When I reached out to the CMHC, a media representative explained that the claim was inaccurate and that the funding was actually used for the Solutions Lab initiative. They described it as an 18-month project looking into how affordable housing solutions and it would be in partnership with the University of British Columbia and Generation Squeeze. Blacklocks pointed to a personalized invite they got their hands on saying, we need to make it so that no Canadian relies on gains in housing wealth to feel secure. In their tweet, they conveniently lopped off the to feel secure part. If you go through Evan Sedol's interviews and his speeches on home ownership over the past few years, you will find that he's been quite outspoken on how there's this over-reliance on real estate investing as Canada's sole saving strategy. So with this long-held idea that owning a home is the only way you're going to be able to retire and that renting will keep you poor, of course everyone will do what they can to run into the housing market and invest in a house, driving up prices and then causing huge affordability issues in Canada's major cities, bringing with it all these peripheral challenges to unaffordable housing that we've seen in Vancouver and Toronto particularly. Anyway, the same invitation didn't mention any tax policy, whether it was related to home equity or otherwise. In fact, at that point, they hadn't even had their first meeting yet, so nothing has been established in their research. I understand that Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze had opined in the past that homeowners were given an unfair advantage because of the wealth, the tax-free wealth that they have on hand. And in the invite, there is a mention of a catch-22 related to the financialization of housing. That is, in their words, you cannot make housing profitable and affordable at the same time. 
When I wrote the story for Yahoo Finance Canada, quite a few readers actually got back to me on the story, elicited a lot of responses. Some were more level-headed than others, saying that the Catch-22 aspect of the invitation was clearly code for some sort of upcoming tax policy. Thing is, I can only report on what's established as fact. I can't editorialize on what's code for what and pass that off as fact. But that won't stop annoying anonymous commenters uh, reaching out saying that I'm a Trudeau groupie and that I'm bad at my job. But you know, whatever, we'll rant over. The CMHC maintained that it wouldn't be pursuing a home equity tax and has been very adamant about it, which drew some criticism from real estate analysts that said, maybe the idea shouldn't be dismissed outright. Wealth divides are a very important topic in this year in particular because the economic fallout from COVID-19 has driven these divides between homeowners and renters even further. So I wrote a follow-up to the story, speaking with John Pasalis about how, as a homeowner, he has these massive tax subsidies, um, first off with the capital gain on his house, which is 100% tax-free, and the imputed rents. Whether you agree with John or not, he raises some very valid concerns here. I also spoke with Evan Sedal and um, spoke with him about the CMHC's mandate in the face of COVID-19 in these uncertain times and uh, what the organization is doing, not only to tackle the challenges that uh, Canada Canadian homeowners are facing, but just what they're doing about these wealth divides that are sure to be driven even further. Sadal told me the CMHC has been approaching this issue with a supply and demand strategy. So that is to invest in more rental stocks so that there would be more supply on the market. It pushes down prices and then renters ideally have more to save at the end of the day. He also said something that really stood out to me. Oh, I mean, it's something he's been saying for a few years now, but I think it really holds a renewed sense of weight this year. He explained that the obsessive pursuit towards home ownership would drive prices to such a height that once it reached its peak, it would suddenly hit this immense drop that would land squarely on the shoulders of the youngest entrance to the housing market, so your millennial generation. More specifically, he said, when the value of one asset outpaces the economic production of an economy, at some point it has to end. The dream will become a nightmare. He added that if these risks could be mitigated now, there would be less of a severe impact for these young first-time home buyers. Responses to these comments range from complete agreement to kind of criticizing the CMHC for having these measures that were somewhat complicit in the part of the crisis that we're seeing today. There were a lot of responses on Twitter and a few emails speaking to this effect. Steve Soretsky, a realtor and one of the strongest voices, I think, in the Canadian finance community, also happens to be a friend of mine on Twitter, um, kind of echoed this sentiment in one of his YouTube videos. It's funny because, you know, you see stuff like that and then CMHC Sadal came coming out again saying all oh, this, you know, Dreamboat home ownership is going to be turned into a nightmare. And um, well, he may be true, that you know, this, this could become destabilizing. It, it's ironic because these are the same kind of decisions of policymakers that uh, you know that are coming out and saying this thing. Oh, you know, too much debt, and you know, we need to kind of slow it down. And these guys are the ones that are in control of that. And then you have you know CMHC coming out with the insured mortgage purchase program, which is effectively. Um, taking mortgages off the bank's balance sheet to allow them to continue to lend um, into the real estate market. So that kind of supports the housing market price wise. So it's like all these policy measures that they put in place are, are effectively designed to keep the asset prices uh, high, yet they're complaining about the wealth inequality that it's creating. Um, so you can see this kind of catch 22 that is just so blatantly obvious to anyone that's paying attention. Go check out his channel, he's a great watch and he's a lot smarter than me. I'm not sure what the state of housing or the state of these wealth divides will look like after the pandemic subsides, hopefully sooner rather than later, but it's probably gonna get more severe before it gets better. And 
I suspect that Canada has fewer tools on hand to deal with these issues. I've lost all ambition or worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one you love. I've lost all ambition or worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one you love. Remember that thing I told you about the private lenders not following CMHC's mandate and I told you to remember it, but you probably forgot it because I'm throwing information at you at a rapid fire rate? We'll place a part in this section. A letter from the CMHC was leaked to Bloomberg News. In it, Evan Sedol was asking these private lenders to just reconsider their high-risk lending practices. Sedol also asked these private lenders not to undermine the CMHC's market presence and thereby limit its ability to respond to economic crisis like COVID-19. After this letter was leaked, Evan Sedol posted it in full on LinkedIn. Uh, you can actually see it in the description, I posted it below. The often quoted line is, the CMHC's purview extends beyond our narrow commercial interests to macroeconomic impacts, and there is a dark economic underbelly to this business that I want to expose. Having the letter out there in the public gave people that in the industry a chance to read about the full scope of Sadal's message, kind of express their own concerns. But what it didn't do is stop a few people from mischaracterizing the letter, saying that the CMHC was trying to stop this private lending operations outright. In fact, right on the first page, it says, while we would prefer that our competitors followed our lead for the good of our economy, they ne nevertheless remain free to offer insurance to those for whom we would not. The letter goes into further detail about putting first-time home buyers in houses with negative equity and how high household debt puts a drag on economic consumption. The message ended on this line. If you want us in wartime, please support us in peacetime. The industry wasn't exactly amenable here, either blaming the CMHC for not doing enough to address the supply and demand issue, or just not agreeing with the house price decline outlook. The hype sort of died down aside from a few lingering opinion pieces. Both on social media and in the press, Evan Sedol has been called alarmist, elitist, and weird. One such comment came from Phil Sofer saying, Sedol's a strange guy and the CMHC is suffering as a result of it. Oof. Someone should give Sidal a hug. Another thing Sofer mentioned was that the underwriting rule change backfired on CMHC. For Sidal's perspective, it was the letter leak that backfired on whoever released it to discredit the CMHC. After this ordeal, things finally started to calm down. Just kidding, they heated right back up again. It was a late evening on August 24th when unsuspecting Vancouver realtor Owen Biglin started tweeting about leverage in real estate and making your money work for you. Many people miss the leverage factor in real estate. Buy a condo for 500k with 10% down, three years later that condo is appreciated to 550k. Many look at it as a 10% return when it's actually a 100% return. Leverage is how true wealth is built. You need to get your money working. Sidal stepped into the picture. <sighs> because in your made-up world, house prices only go up. This kind of investment advice is like selling penny stocks because they're cheap. You do realize leverage works just as powerfully when prices go down, or were you not alive in 2008, 2009? He wasn't done. A lesson in leverage for Owen Biglin and the trees grow to the sky crowd. Including transaction costs and fees you pay him for bad advice, a first-time homebuyer with a 5% down is underwater from day one. 85 to 1 leverage, that's what's available, results in asymmetric losses when prices fall. He still wasn't done. Buy a condo for 500k with 5% down, prices fall 10% and you're forced to sell. You've lost your 25k down payment and still owe 25k more on your mortgage, plus the costs Owen Biglin missed. 19k for mortgage insurance, 25k for real estate fees, 30k interest, legal costs, land transfer taxes. There should be laws against people like Owen Biglin giving this kind of irresponsible financial advice. Nope, still not done. More self-serving advice from Owen Biglin. He says a rented home isn't a roof over your head. And he seems prepared to guarantee that if you buy a house, you'll have a job for life. Unemployment, as a result of the pandemic, will never force you to sell your house. 
It was about 3.26 a.m. when Sadal finally let up. Biglin says his tweet was taken out of context and that there was a previous tweet explaining that leverage works both ways. He also says he's owed an apology. I, I don't think he's getting that apology. Biglin didn't receive that much sympathy, especially since he went after Natalie Obiko Pearson from Bloomberg News in an attempt to discredit one of her stories. He resorted to making things up about her, calling her a girl, probably in her late 20s, with a very little writing history just out of community college, completely ignoring her bachelor's degree in Princeton University and her master's degree. Also, she's got an extensive reporting history. Seriously, how hard is it to look at somebody's LinkedIn profile? Anyway, some have questioned whether it's a good idea for the CEO of a crown corporation to engage in these petty Twitter disputes, and there is a worthwhile debate there. Some stand on the side that someone representing the CMHC in an online forum shouldn't be getting into these petty spats, while others argue that it's his right as an individual to express his own opinion on his own time. Sadal has argued that it is his responsibility to not stay silent about these things, and sometimes this is the form it takes. People either praise Sadal for calling out the dishonesty in the real estate industry, or they accuse him of just catering to this bearish following and trying to pump up this public image. Many also point out that in the final months leading up to his departure from the CMHC, he's really leaning into this honest tone. I'd imagine with the pandemic, the recession, all these things going on, um, this is not at all what he probably expected his last year at the CMHC to look like. But he's going out with a bang, whether he planned to or not. I believe that's everything. Alright, so that is the summary of the CMHC in 2020. Like I mentioned, I wanted to do more of an analysis piece on specifically on Evan Sedol's tenure at the CMHC, but that will come later. I just think that since so much happened this year with the organization, it warranted its own video explainer because, well, am I going to write a sequel article to the one I already wrote? Just, no, that's not what I do. Okay, so I know I've been on a hiatus for a while, but I'm hoping to crank out more videos, not at the weekly rate that I had been doing before the hiatus, because that was just too demanding, especially on top of uh, jobs on the side I was doing here. I like the consistency, but I don't want it to come at the cost of quality, and I plan on doing more ambitious things with my editing. You probably noticed the new setup, and that's part of the hiatus because I moved closer to downtown. I'm pretty excited about it. Anyway, kids, thanks for watching. If you want to give this video a thumbs up, that would be pretty rad. Uh, if you want to look at other analysis that I have coming up in the future, just hit that subscribe button and um, I'll pop up in your feed. Another thing you probably noticed with my setup is that the bookshelf is pretty empty. So if you're not going to comment on the CMHC, the least you can do is go down to the comments and recommend a book so old Hughesy here can fill up her shelf. This is Steph Hughes signing off.